I think I hear you clapping, uh, not just for me, but for the idea of it being the final comments of the, uh, you all have made it all the way to the end, and those that endure to the end shall be tired, shall be saved, too. <laughs> and uh, that's what's important. First, let me tell you that uh, I just spoke with uh, Dr. Walker a moment ago, and he sends his uh, best regards to all of you. Uh, as you know, uh, I think most of you know by now, his wife had open heart surgery uh, last week and has had some complications with some fluid, some thrombophlebitis, some problems with the hemoglobin. Uh, he's been sitting up with her at night, getting up about every two hours. Some of you who have uh, been caregivers know uh, how wearying that is and that you end up just going on adrenaline and he's been keeping that vigil. His daughters have come in to help and so he's going to get some relief tonight. But he wanted me to convey to you that he's very, very sorry he could not be here uh, with all of us. I can assure you on this topic, too, he had been right in the thick of it, right in the middle of it with us, and uh, very concerned about it. As an overseer, of course, he spends and spent a lot of his time dealing with churches and getting people to uh, at least listen, to learn, to, as Dr. Moore says, repent and live together and care for each other, receive each other. Uh, it's extremely important. Not just what we do or what we get accomplished, but how we do it is equally as important with respect and a good process. And I think that's a lot of what we've been saying here uh, in this conference, that we are all part of the people of God. So I wanted to bring you that uh, greeting, and I know that you will continue to lift them up in your prayers. Uh, this has been a very demanding past several weeks in so many regards for so many of us and I know for many of you too to travel distances that you've traveled uh, how difficult that's been I'm curious I don't think anyone's done this this conference yet how many of you would consider yourself a quote <laughs> I put it in quotes lay person not a credential clergy person would you raise your hand how many of those thank goodness I was hoping we had a whole bunch I've been counting them up great You'd hate to have a conference where most of the people were clergy and you were talking about uh, uh, the whole people of God the whole time and you didn't have that good participation. Uh, my remarks will be brief and, of course, extemporaneous because of the nature of being called to sub in here this afternoon. I certainly am not an expert on this, but I guess as a, a pastor still at heart and in my own spirit and how I approach my own work. I hope I approach that still pastorally, someone who has that passion. But I'd like to just offer a few concluding remarks out of my work as a person who labors in word and doctrine with you, uh, along with you, all of you who are Christians, are theologians, as I've told you, who uh, pray and seek to reflect on the meaning of your faith and apply it to daily life. Uh, if it's not practical, then why would you want to have it? If it's not theologically sound, why would you want to practice it? So all of us are practical theologians. All of us are those who labor in word and doctrine and try to live it out faithfully. I thought about the very sobering uh, scripture reading this afternoon from uh, Reverend Land, my, uh, who ministers to me. I say that because the word reverend simply means revered. And I certainly revere her. Uh, my daughter, I think some of you know, uh, ministers greatly uh, to me and I thought about when uh, recently down the road from us three people were executed in our community murdered viciously my daughter was at the hospital not long afterwards with the family of one of the persons killed uh, who had been taken right out of the choir at the church we attend and uh, in very desperate situation and I thought of the students there, uh, the Lee University students and the seminary students and others who lived in that apartment complex, how they were affected. The tremendous need that we have to be a whole people of God, to care for such broken people all around us. If you accept the statistics, at face value, there are only about 2 billion of the 6 billion people that claim to be Christian in any sense affiliated. The church is growing, we understand now. We've heard statistics about that, about how fast the church is growing. But others are growing too. It's a huge challenge to think of people who live in darkness and brokenness every day. It's not a matter of religion, it's a matter of life. And it is a matter of God. The scripture reading told us today it's a matter of fire. I really don't fear change. 
I really don't fear. I mean, the only point in your life at which everything in your body is at perfect chemical equilibrium is at the point of death. So I like change. I like the input of things. I don't fear that. And I can tell you, praise be to God with fear and trembling, I really don't fear death, my own death. Uh, because I know the one who's defeated, the one who has the power of the fear of death. And I have faced death before, and it frightened me later to learn that I wasn't afraid of death. <laughs> that was scary. But I do fear God. And the fire of God will try our works. And the work that we are doing in the body of Christ with one another if it's wood, hay, and stubble, when the fire comes, it will burn up. It's not just the effective things or what's effective and what's not effective. It's what will remain after the fire. That's what counts. The three theological loci, points, that I would like to lift up for your reflection at the close of this conference are three metaphors for the church that apply to all of us, whatever our gift or function in the body. They are comprehensive terms, the three most comprehensive terms, the third being one that I think is puts together several things. The first is the people of God. If we are going to be the one whole people of God, there are implications of that for understanding what it takes and what's at stake in development of laity, the people of God for the 21st century. That is a political statement. Herod understood that. Caesar understands that. Every world leader understands that when there are people who begin to talk about a transnational, transeconomic, transracial, transgender kind of reality called the people of God. And they begin to take that seriously in every community and every nation. And you educate them to be the one whole international people of God. This people is bounded, defined, delimited by the righteousness of God. As surely as Israel was bounded on the right and left by the sea that they marched through, we are bounded and defined by the righteousness of God. And in that righteous path, we walk forward. We can turn to the right or the left and be lost in the watery chaos. We can stop to worship at the gods of this world of beauty, brains, brawn, and bucks and judge other people in a carnal way. But if we do, we will pay a price. There is still the righteousness of God. Justice. Let justice rain down. That's a fearful thing to say. And oh Lord, have mercy. You have to say that at the same time. I think about the stories of our people that have fallen in battle I think about the stories of commanders in Vietnam if they had a position overrun they would phone their position up to the person in the airplane the air cover the enemies in the camp were overrun drop it on us dive for a hole that's what we say God drop it on us we're in among them they're in among us drop it on us drop the fire come with your righteous Revealing word. Discern among us good and evil. Separate wheat and chaff. Come among us and shine brightly. And help us learn what it is to make disciples who can make disciples who can make disciples. When you serve the righteousness of God in a politically divided and dangerous world and environment, you know that you need everybody. You think they debate in Israel about whether or not women should serve in the military? No, everybody has to serve. They know they're surrounded all around. They look at millions against them. They say, you know, everybody's got to serve. Our whole nation, our whole, it's at stake. Do we need women in ministry? We need everybody in ministry. The challenge is so great. We need everybody in ministry. Serving righteously. 
Well, what about the kingdom? We've heard something about the kingdom. I said to you humorously this afternoon or this morning when the conclusion of Dr. Lockerman's address, we were promised the kingdom, but we got the church. I know we all want the pure thing. I know there's a woman who told uh, Dwight Moody, he said, you know, Mr. Moody, I joined your church, but I'm looking for the perfect church. He said, Madam, when you find it, don't join it, you'll ruin it. We all want the perfect church. I don't want politics. I don't want messiness. I don't want stupid people. I don't want weak people. I don't want carnal people. Then you don't want to be in the church. We got them all in the church. The strong, the weak, the carnal, the spiritual. What's more, we got people that you won't like and won't like you. Races, classes. We try to create a homogeneous unit, but people keep coming in with a hetero agenda. And then we find out God's behind it all, trying to make us the one people of God who will serve His righteous purposes in the world. The one public people of God. How can we live righteously at the bank in Cleveland? At the loan office? Down at the commissioner's office? The mayor's office? In every business? In every school? Is this righteous? Is this pleasing to God? Does this honor people? Does it honor the people of God? When you ask those questions, then you've begun to realize what it is to be the one people of God and what it is to form people to be a part of His people. And you don't need kings. You don't need rulers. You don't need a regency. You need servants. When David should have been out fighting with the troops, he's up on his balcony looking at Uriah's wife. He should have been out with the laity, the people of God, suffering with them, serving with them. Instead, he didn't give his life. He gave the life of his faithful servant to get what he wanted for a season. And the whole nation suffered. Oh, yes, we're in a body. We're in the church a lot of us suffer for the, what the few do sometimes. Yep, that's how God made us. He made us one people. You ever gone to a family reunion? Man, the older you get, those things can be fierce. I go to my mother's family, the craziest people in the world, my mother's family. And we're crazy along with them. They all talk at the same time. They all fuss at each other about things 50, 60 years ago. They'll go at it, and then all of a sudden, I'll go in and throw the grenade in the middle of them. Say, but you remember your mama, don't you? Mama Anderson, how she prayed and cried. Yeah, Mama Anderson, oh, don't talk to me about mama. Yeah, she prayed. She was a good one. They'll all start crying. I say, why do you always bring that up? Well, because God wants you to remember. She didn't want you to fuss and fight. She wanted you to repent. And love each other and pray for each other. That's why. I got an aunt who carries a pearl handle pistol in her purse. She says, I don't like to be around you. I said, well, I don't like to be around you either. Did you make me cry? I said, I know I do. But you got to remember God. We got to be the one whole people of God. And remember that these people are our brothers and our sisters. We don't need kings. There's only one king in this kingdom. It's Jesus. Nobody can be a pastor unless folk help them. You can't, if you're a pastor, you can't fulfill your gift unless folk help you. You know it's true. You start out pastoring, those people in the church, a bunch of them, a lot more mature than you are. You know it. Later, years later, you discover there's still some people that are more mature. No more things than you know. What are you going to do? You're going to have to fake it or be a servant. You may fake it and get by with it. You may be successful. You may fool them into thinking that you know more than anybody there and you are the king of that church, but you will be faking it. God knows you're not the king. And they know it too. That's why people can fall from very prominent ministries and very few people shed a tear because it was about power. 
and they weren't bonded personally. They didn't have feeling for one another. That's how churches can go through and be very successful. And yet if we don't have a feeling for each other, a tragedy happens and the body doesn't mourn. It just goes on as if nothing happened. That's an index of what can happen to us in the pyramid church. Where we exist to build up images for an individual. Now let's talk about the vision thing for a minute. Without a vision, the people are unrestrained. A vision of righteousness. A vision of the one people of God. A vision of the one mission we've been given by God. Who gets the vision? A lot of people can get the vision. We come together and pray that God will give us the vision for what to do next. It may be the weakest person in the church. It may be the most unlikely source. The pastor is not the only visionary person in a congregation. I hope not. What's your vision? We, our pastor has a vision. You, ever had, you have a vision for ministry? No. No. Whatever he has, that's what I have. You ever pray about that for your church? No, it's not my job. It's his job. He casts it. I pick it up. I fund it. When it's time to die, are you ready to die for it? Oh, no. No. That's a little severe. You know, we just we got a program we're carrying out this year. You know, we're going to double in a, in, a, in in a month. That's our vision: double in a month. Have you prayed that through? Is it in your soul? Are you giving yourself to that with godly fear and dedication? Is that your corporate mission? And has God shown you where to reach and probe in that community? And are you going at it? In the fear of the Lord as a military operation, as the soldiers of the cross. We don't need kings. We need servants. We need people who will be a part of the people of God and press God's righteousness throughout the community. If there are people oppressed, if there are widows, if there are orphans, if there are the abused and neglected, the hungry, the beat down, then we've got a message. It's not just find a need and fill it. Man, we create them. We say, you think you've got a need? Let me tell you a big need. We're doing this to these people and God doesn't like it. We need to repent. We need to feed them, clothe them, visit them, care for them because of the righteousness of God. Because we're His people and they need to be a part of His people. They don't know it yet, but they are part of the people of God. He wants to invite them in to be His people. Second theological rubric I'd use is the body of Christ. Very radical. We've had it read to us this week. I love the idea of the body of Christ and I hate it. That's why I'm glad we take the communion. We can chew it. A Jewish man once said, he said, you Christians, it's really good. You get to drink and chew on your God. He said, God chose us as the Jews. Sometimes we wish he'd chosen someone else. He said, it's a fearsome thing to be chosen by God and wrestle with God. What do I mean by that? Because God makes us so much a part of each other. We want to be in an organization. We can bail out whenever we want to. God says, no, I'm going to knit you together. I'll knit you so close. When that one's hurt, you'll hurt. When that one's blessed, you'll be blessed. When that one's struggling and being oppressed, you'll feel it. I'll burden you. You'll be in the body. I'm going to make you organically related. When we abuse people in the body, when we put them down, when we don't recognize their ministry, it's not just a matter of, oh, we did something not quite kosher. We're despising our own selves. We're despising ourselves. It's a corporate view. I know we're filled with individualism. I know we're in North America, but it's sick. It's what's produced the divided, dysfunctional, disintegrated families. And now more than ever before, the church has to be a body and a family. To heal people. Sunday school won't get it. Mass worship won't get it. we got to be a body and a family and take up the burdens of one another and bear them. we got to do it. For the healing of people. Then you don't start asking, well, who's laity and who's clergy around you? You say, my goodness, we need everybody in on this, don't we? Who's going to be with Fred this week? He fell off the wagon again. 
What about Sue? She's, she's so angry today. She's remembering what her father did to her. Who's going to be with her? We got these kids over here. Their, their mom just got murdered. Who's going to take them? We had a woman in our church. She came in. Her son was an alcoholic. Her daughter was a prostitute in the community. She had diabetes. And her son had just come in and twisted her toe. And it got infected and he had to cut it off. She was on welfare. She'd never been a Christian. It was, she outlasted three husbands. Everybody thought she was stupid. You know, didn't know who she was. She'd struggled with things all of her life. She was a college graduate living on $3,000 a year. She comes in. She has to have surgery. She can't afford anything. Who is she? She's our grandmother in the Lord. That's the family. Folks, here's our grandmother. She needs surgery. What are you going to do about it? Well, that's her problem. No, it's not her problem. She's ours. Accountability and stewardship. Do you know what stewardship means? It means accountability to one another and liability for one another in the body. Become a people. Become a body. That destroys all of our consumer models of the church, doesn't it? In the consumer model, you can have the church is like a service station. The pastor is the manager of the station. He's got a multiple staff. You know, somebody's on the lube rack. Somebody does the battery, you know, the worship leader or somebody. Got a youth minister over there changing tires, you know. Hey, get that done. I'll fire you and get somebody else. Compatible with my view of the station here. We've got to pump this gas. By the way, sir, they're selling it 10 cents cheaper. Oh, we've got to lower our price. Let's pump it cheaper. They'll quit coming. People in the cars have no relationship to people before them or after them. They just want their blessing and they're gone. But in the body, you're joined together. You ever tried to drag somebody through the water that's drowning? Remember when I got my life-saving merit badge? 13, if you can believe it, I was really skinny. The guy that I got it from was about 6'5", weighed 200 and something pounds, was a Ph.D. physics major at the University of Alabama. He had about 12 of us boys in the Boy Scouts who thought we wanted life-saving merit badge. He took us out at 8 o'clock in the morning. It was cold, smoke coming up off the lake. It was about, you know, 100 feet out in the middle. He got about 50 yards out there. He looked like Goliath. He said, who'll be first? Come on out, boys. I'd always volunteer first. You know, that's how I deal with fear. Go right at it. I'll do it. And the rest of the people said, yes, yes, he'll do it. <laughs> you know. He said, remember, boys, the first rule when you save somebody, they're going to try to kill you. I'm talking about the body of Christ. The people you're trying to love will try to kill you. They're in trouble. They're sinking. They will try to kill you. So you have to remember why. And I ask myself, do I need this little patch on my sash as I'm, as I'm dog paddling? You know, is it important? Wouldn't cooking be better? <laughs> Sewing merit badge. Bird watching merit. Without no offense to Dr. Walter. Something. You know. Some other merit badge. And he, David Copeland's out there in the middle. He says, come on, little fella. And so you get to them and you go down in front of them and you grab their knees and you turn it around. And I came up behind him. I couldn't even reach across his chest. I grabbed his, you know, his chest and I grabbed hairs and I'm clawing. And he's bleeding. He's, like, oh, oh. he's just kind of... And so he starts rolling like an alligator. And I'm going... Blub, 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 blub. I swim off. I'm choking. He says, I'm still drowning. I said, I am too. He said, yeah, but you got to save me. Isn't that what ministry is? I'm tired too. I'm drowning too. Yeah, but you got to save me. I'm your brother and I'm your sister. Didn't he say it? No greater love? That's what he said. Do you believe it? What's the last person in the church you ever tried to restore? You ever wept over and said, my God, they're going under. They're going to drown. Well, that's not my job. Well, whose job is it? Are they yours or not? He took me under three on three different occasions. I thought I was going to die. I finally drug him in. He's not even winded. He's bleeding, but he's not. 
when he's got claw marks all across his chest. <laughs> I've got his skin still under my fingernails. I got out and just, I laid up on the, you know, the thing for a while, just like a beach twelve. Uh, 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 uh. I didn't care then whether they gave me the merit badge or not. They just let me get out of the camp. You know, I said, just let me leave here. In the body of Christ, you are bound together. You're joined together. It's organic. And we have to structure our churches so people get the point. Would you attend our Sunday school? No. You're a part of this body. Here's structures for us to share our stories. Does anybody want to hear your story? Does anybody give a rip about your story? I don't care who you are. We've got a Bible study going on here. Sit down there. We're talking about loving one another. It's Christ love the church. <laughs> I felt that way before. People come in. One more person. You know, just sit down. You know, I don't want to hear another story. You got problems? We've all got problems. Then they tell you your story and you say, oh, well, that is a problem. You know, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I said that to you. Come on in. You structure the church for that. You, the people of God are motivated by love. Isn't that complicated? Ministry starts where love gets focused. Well, Brother Land, is it a ministry in the church or out of the church? Yes. But Brother Land, I thought the whole mission of the church was just to evangelize the lost. Oh, no. It isn't just to evangelize the lost. Then you've got to care. That's like people saying, gee, dear, I'd love to have a baby with you. That would be a wonderful experience. Okay, let's have a baby. You go to the hospital, you have the baby. Oh, wasn't that a wonderful experience? And you just leave. The nurse comes around. Oh, by the way, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You forgot something. What? The baby. You've got to raise this baby now. Nurture this baby. Sit up with this baby at night. No. People talk about maintenance churches. I hope so. Hope you do maintain them. Hope you do establish them, strengthen them in the faith. That way people will see how we love each other and be provoked to jealousy and know that we're Christ's disciples. The third paradigm I've looked at, the third metaphor of the church that I'd lift up for our consideration and understanding the whole people of God. Lots to talk about in the body, differentiation of cells and organ systems and how they work together. You don't like organization? Well, good. I mean, everything's organized that's alive. You can't just put anything into your body. Not just anything will work. And you can wear it out or you can uh, not have enough stress and you'll die with little activity. It's got to be treated properly. It's organic. There's differentiation. You have a place. Every part's important. We have to find ways to honor that in our services, in our training, in everything we do. Third principle, third metaphor, third biblical image of the church, the missionary fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The church is a fellowship. I'm combining things here. The church is a fellowship, but it's missionary. It's constituted as such by the Holy Spirit. Just as Sinai belongs to the whole people of God, so does Pentecost. The whole church is Pentecostal. Every Christian's a Pentecostal in the most generic fundamental sense. In that we all have this mission and we only have one source of power. God, the Holy Spirit, is the only one sufficient for this mission. The people of God tells us our belonging. The, the body of Christ tells us our identity. The missionary fellowship tells us our vocation. It is to be a missionary fellowship. Not just a mission, but a fellowship. Not just a fellowship, but a missionary fellowship. The day of the pastor as boss, the day of the pastor as manager, the day of the pastor even as psychological enabler to cope is over. It's the day of the missionary pastor and of the missionary congregation in North America. We're going to learn what other people have learned around the world. We're in a secular, post-Christian pagan environment and the days of easy growth by co-optation and excitation of other Christians are over. Now we need to evangelize. Now we need to do spiritual battle. And when you get into a battle and you have a mission, you know you need everybody. You know the best way that pastors can demonstrate that they respect the whole people of God? Join them in the ranks. 
The worst generals, it seems to me, in military history are those who sit behind a desk. The best are on the field with the troops. If the troops go down, they go down. They're right there with them. If the strategy is wrong, they die with them. You're right beside people in ministry. And they know that. Great leaders are not people that leave you awestruck in their presence and so glad that they gave you five minutes of their time. Great leaders are those who stand beside you in the midst of the battle. You see sweat rolling off their brow. You hear their prayers. You know they need you and you need them. That's a great leader. You're in the missionary fellowship. You've got a mission. It's focused. You know where the people are you're trying to reach and you're involved in reaching it and you do it with the people of God. And ministry starts springing up wherever love gets focused. And you pray down power and you wait for the empowerment of God to engage and sustain and go forward in the mission. It leads me to say that the church should be a temple, a place for regularized worship and sacrifice. And we are a temple as we heard in the scripture reading this afternoon. And we're also a tabernacle. We're a movement of the Holy Spirit. Every movement requires certain elements, certain things. It needs a fundamental ideology. Well, ours happens to be the faith once delivered to the saints. The apostolic faith, the faith of the Bible, the Old and New Testaments, the one people of God, the one covenant of life from the one God over all, the one Savior, Jesus Christ, the one Holy Spirit. It's a movement. We are founded on what we believe on truth And truth alone will set people free. It doesn't matter if they like you or don't like you. It doesn't matter if they think you're pleasing or not pleasing or how you look. It's whether or not the truth is there and delivers people. We've got to have the truth. Don't sell the truth. Hang on to the truth. Die for the truth. Sometimes when I was a pastor, I'd be teaching on Wednesday night and I'd just veer right off into heresy. People would say, well, you know, Gee, the members knew what I was doing. I'd be teaching on the Jesus Christ, teaching from Colossians, and I start teaching, veering over and over and over into Jesus was really a good man who got he got filled with the Spirit just like we can get filled with the Spirit. He was just a great man. We can be like him. Right on over into adoptionism. After a while, a new Christian there would raise their hand and say, "Uh, Pastor, uh, I don't know, but you know, you said Jesus was a good man, but he was was he God?" I said, "You're questioning me." What do you know about homoousios? You homoousios, you? What do you know about this? A little private in joke here. The, the whole dispute about the being of the Lord, you know, in relation to God. Do you know Greek? You know, no, I'm a pastor here. I'm teaching. You're supposed to submit. I know, pastor, but I was just, you know, here in the text, it's, in the text, I'm telling you the text. I know, but could I just had... And then people start clapping in the congregation. I said, stand up. And we all clap. I said, if you're ever anywhere and you can't raise a question out of the Holy Scripture, get out of there as quick as you can. And be taught. The whole people of God have to be respected. You can be corrected by anybody, but any question to be raised because we want to establish people in the truth. Only the truth will set people free. You've got to have recruitment face-to-face, hand-to-hand in a movement. I love what the pastor said this morning. We've had this invitational thing. We need infiltration. That's right. You've got to go and take it to folks, and you've got to have recruitment face-to-face. That's when you know something's really happening. People start face-to-face, hand-to-hand. They don't just lob it. You know, you see these people that are witnesses, you know, and they're like dive bomber witnesses. They load up with the tracks. Mm, sinners at 3 o'clock mm, boom they drop their tracks boy we gave them the word today didn't we let's head for the barn you know <laughs> we have programs like that you know PR I like that let's do it with advertising that's good there's no substitute for face to face hand to hand heart to heart love Witnesses are still martyrs. If we evangelize the world, the billions that are left, it will be because of shed blood. Jesus and the churches. 
We're living in the most persecuted, harassed century of Christian history. People are dying daily for the gospel. Why don't we hear their names? Why don't we know the martyrs? Even in our own church. Could it be because we're more impressed with other accomplishments? What greater accomplishment is there than a person who gave their life for Jesus Christ and the gospel? Does it tell you where our values are? If it was your mother or your father or your son or your daughter or your spouse that gave their life, would you remember their name? In the missionary fellowship that operates as soldiers of the cross, you remember the names of the martyrs. When you have a memorial day, you give thanks. My dear brothers and sisters, in an index of the sickness of the church that we don't know our martyrs. You have an organization in a missionary fellowship. It's a network. It's not a pyramid. It's a network. It's reticulate. And it has many different heads. Leadership moves around for this ministry, that ministry. You don't have one head in a missionary fellowship except Jesus. Leadership moves around in the various ministries. And you want to cultivate that. You want to say, Lord, we need leadership for this ministry. You want to cultivate that leadership. And people take over. You say, who's the leader here? And people point. Well, this person leads in that ministry. They, they lead in that ministry. I know, but who's the leader? Jesus. Well, who's the pastor? I'm one of the pastors. Well, who's the head person? Jesus. I know, but are you the senior pastor? Yeah, I'm the senior pastor. Does that mean you run things? No. I'm not the king. I lead. I care for souls. I don't count them. I know them. I want to know them. I want somebody to know them. I want to have the kind of organization where they care for each other. Small groups are not just a nice strategy. It's a way for people to know each other. You can't obey the Bible unless you have something like small groups because we've got to have re-socialization in the body of Christ in this movement. You take people in. It's got to happen face to face. How they get messed up through interpersonal relationships in the world. How they're going to get healed through the body of Christ and through the, the missionary fellowship. You organize for transformation, for healing, for mobilization. You organize around your missionary mandate and you maintain the troops. It's a reticular organization. It's polycephalous. It has many heads. When you kill off one person, you don't kill the church. Let's kill that pastor. It'll kill the church. No, it won't. Not in a missionary fellowship. You kill the pastor, you'll energize. God will raise up 15 others in his or her place. The church grows through opposition. The bad news is you will suffer persecution. The good news is you will suffer persecution. And it will push you together. It will make you value people. It will make you close. There's nothing like going through a real spiritual battle with real consequences for real souls, real people, real ministry to pull you together. Or to reveal that you don't want to be together. That you, don't, you resist repenting because you resist being together. That's why disunity is such a sin. All the works of the flesh divide. Every one of them. And God wants to unite his body. The whole people of God is a people of discipline. Did you ever hear of an army without discipline? You can't even have a good parade without some discipline. Much less a pilgrimage to heaven through this world. Church discipline becomes the matter of all members. To guide and disciple and to correct and reprove and rebuke and instruct in righteousness that every one of them may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It becomes the work of the people of God. When you come to worship, people have testimonies of what God has done. When you come to worship, they have prayers and intercessions for people in and out of the church. When you come to the fellowship, you see people bearing burdens. You see people lingering. You see them in each other's homes. You hear them speak of one another. You don't get run over in the parking lot after the service. You train. 
You train them for their mission, for their ministry. What's our mission? What's our ministry? You train them for it in every aspect of society. You train them in the church. You train them in the college. You train them in the university. You train them in the seminary. You train them wherever you can get them. And you train them for ministry and mission in every facet of life. And you collaborate. You work together in the kingdom of God. What does power mean? It means the priesthood of believers. It means the prophethood of believers. Sons and daughters prophesy. I believe there are a lot of parents who are afraid for their sons and daughters to prophesy. To speak the truth in love. Not just the image of the Old Testament solitary prophet. I mean a whole congregation of prophets and prophetesses. Speaking the truth in love, growing up in Christ and every good thing, and speaking the word of God with anointing and passion to this generation. That's the vision of Joel and the vision of Pentecost, the vision of Acts, for the whole people of God. That requires the anointing. I think one of the most powerful Pentecostal scriptures in the Bible is in Hebrews 9:14, by the eternal spirit he offered himself. It is finally a self-offering. It is finally that we make ourselves available. God keeps me in Cleveland. God put me in Cleveland. He took me out of Atlanta and put me in Cleveland. He positioned me. I'm a soldier. I will go where he sends me. If I need to leave with Jeanette Cheshire, my wife and my, my family tomorrow and go back and go to Russia, I'm ready. Let's go. You want to be in God's will. You want to feel his pleasure with you. Lord, it's bad, but I feel your pleasure. Oh, Lord, I know you're pleased that you've got me where you want me. It doesn't feel so good all the time, but Lord, I feel your pleasure in me. Thank God. That's empowering. And when we feel that together, we know God has brought us together. And we have a common mission. And we're in solidarity with it. To live as the righteous, loving, powerful people of God. Then we're built up and encouraged. For that we do need the anointing every day. Like the Messiah whose name means the anointed one. We need to be those who are anointed. You can go back to your house. Go back to your dorm. Go back where you want to. Tonight and think about all this. I got to think about it. Every day I say Lord is this, is this where you want to play? Is this what you want me to do today? I want to serve. In the small things and other things. Lord I want to be sensitive. If you want to nudge me. If you want to say something to me. Lord, I want to live my life with integrity and with love. Lead me, guide me, instruct me. I need my brothers and sisters. I want to need them. I don't ever want to not be needy. Lead us, Lord. Anoint us. Help us together in the body of Christ. That's why you're at this conference. Because God wants you to be fully a part of the people of God and never be a spectator who just pays their dues to be left alone again. Never to go searching just for the services that you can get from a church, but to say, Lord, where do you want to station me, position me? Where do you want to transfer me? Where do you want to put me to serve in your army?